Welcome to episode 216 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Joe Roebuck, who served in the FBI for nearly 28 years. Joe was assigned to the Atlanta division where he initially worked bank robbery, fugitives, and civil rights investigations. However, for the majority of his career, he specialized in public corruption. In this episode, Joe reviews his DUI, driving under the influence, ticket fixing bribery case involving more than 6,000 tickets, which were never adjudicated. Joe's investigation proved that assistant traffic court solicitor, Ken London, took bribes to make those cases disappear. London committed suicide and was never officially charged, but his daughter, Jennifer London Wallace, helped convict his accomplices by testifying at the trial's of the defense attorney and private investigator also involved in the ticket-fixing scheme. Jennifer is also a guest on this episode, providing her personal insights about the investigation and her decision to cooperate and testify for the prosecution. Joe Roebuck acknowledges the assistance of other cooperators and law enforcement partners at the Atlanta Police Department and the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. After his retirement, Joe became the CEO of Gold Shield 1811 Incorporated, a firm comprised of former FBI, IRS, Secret Service, and Homeland Security agents who specialize in corporate investigations, executive protection, and physical security assessments. This case has become one of my favorites. When Joe said he had invited the daughter of his subject to be on the show with him, I didn't know what to think, but the interview turned out to be amazing. Jennifer's story is about courage and doing the right thing. But before we get to the interview, I want to remind those of you attending Crime Con House Arrest on November 21st, that I'll be on Podcast Row. Please stop by to virtually hang out with me and talk about your favorite FBI retired case file review episodes. Also, I want to let you know that I resent my November reader team email to those of you who didn't have a chance to read it last week with all the election stuff going on. If you missed it last week and you don't see it in your inbox this week, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and promotions tab. Of course, I want to welcome new listeners and invite you to join my reader team. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There is nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoir. You can join my reader team on my website or use the link in your podcast app's description of this episode. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guests, retired agent Joe Roebuck and his special guest, Jennifer London Wallace. Hi, Joe. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jerry. Morning, Jerry. Well, Joe, I think before we get started, I mean, this is going to be a fascinating case review. But before we get started, could you tell everyone a little bit more about who Jennifer is and why? You decided that you wanted to have her participate in the case review, which I am absolutely thrilled that you did. Ken London was the subject of my case that I'm here to talk about today. And Jennifer actually testified in two trials that 
resulted from our investigation. And we kind of lived those experiences together. She was very impressive in how she handled it. We were just talking offline here that she was only 26 years old at the time she testified in some front page cases in Atlanta about a very emotional part of her life. She was testifying about the actions of her father, not a position that very many people are in. Because of going through this experience together, we have stayed in touch for practically 30 years. And I was just talking to her husband recently, and it just occurred to me when he called me about something completely unrelated to this, that it was sort of a sign that maybe I should see if Jennifer wanted to do this with me. So, and she agreed, and I'm very pleased about that. And I I can tell you, I've always been very impressed with where Jennifer is now compared to where she was coming from. So that's part of the story. And uh, I'm thrilled that Jennifer is here with us. I make it a point that FBI retired case file review does not sensationalize or exploit the crimes or the victims. My purpose is to show everyone who the FBI is and what the FBI does, just how we investigate a case. But I think what is sometimes missed in all investigations is how those procedures, how that process of investigating a crime affects not just the agents and the subjects, but people that are in the peripheral, the agents' relatives and the subjects' relatives and the prosecutors' relatives, because they see what's being done as they go through step by step. And so this is really a very special situation that we're going to be able to see things from more than just the side of the agent. So where do you want to get started? When did you first come involved in this investigation? Well, the year was 1992. And the reason we got involved was my office, which was the FBI office in Atlanta, got a call from the Atlanta Police Department. APD was up on a drug wire. And they intercepted a telephone call between a prosecutor in the Atlanta traffic court and a drug dealer. And the prosecutor was offering to fix a DUI for the drug dealer in exchange for money. And now the term fix, if, if you haven't heard that term, it means make the DUI go away. No record of a DUI. The DUI won't be prosecuted. So the prosecutor that was picked up on that wire was an individual by the name of Ken London, Jennifer Wallace's father. His title at the time was Assistant Solicitor of the Atlanta Traffic Court. He was a prosecutor in the traffic court. Ken London was already on the FBI's radar. He had previously gotten caught up in an FBI undercover case where he talked to an FBI undercover agent posing as a criminal about fixing traffic cases and running criminal histories in exchange for cocaine. London was kind of a small fish in that case, so he didn't get prosecuted. And that was really before I came to the FBI in Atlanta. After I got there, we had a walk-in complainant one day. That's somebody who walks in off the street with information they want to provide to the FBI. And I happened to connect with that individual. She was the secretary of Ken London, maybe by then the former secretary. And she said that Ken had fixed a ticket for her and she had some reasons for being there. And so I tried to open a case based on her information. I tried to wire her up and have some recorded conversations, but ultimately that case went nowhere. So in 1992, when we got a call from the Atlanta Police Department, I was already familiar with Ken London and I thought there was enough information to open up a case. Now, Joe, can I ask you why the other case didn't go anywhere? Was, were you unable to get incriminating conversations between him and the cooperator? Well, the cooperator, back, back then and now, that the FBI designates that person as a cooperating witness. She got cold feet, and she was pretty 
pumped up to help us when she first walked in, but when she saw what that was going to involve, she really didn't get with the program that I was trying to to put out to her. And, and so we just weren't getting good evidence. Rather than make bad recordings, as you know, Jerry, when you're making recordings, you can go backwards by making exculpatory recordings. Rather than doing that, we just shut the case down. Based on that information, all that information, the historical information on Ken and this new information off the wiretap, I got a case open. And, you know, at this point, I would say even I knew I was pretty young. You know, I was at the bottom of the ladder. Had I been an experienced agent, I probably wouldn't have wanted to be assigned to this case. But, you know, they had to keep me busy with something. So they said, this doesn't look like the biggest FBI case, but we'll open it and, and let you work at Roebuck. I thought it was important. So I set out with my partners on my squad to try to figure out an approach. After thinking about it, you know, there's a lot of ramp up time when you're trying to do an undercover operation or get wiretaps. I chose to not go in that direction. And, and my partners and I decided we'd go old school. We'd go develop witnesses, use informants, conduct surveillance, and uh, collect documents. But we're going to go historical as opposed to proactive. So, one of the first things we wanted to figure out was. How was London fixing these tickets? We needed some inside information from the traffic court, we thought. After cycling through who the likely candidates were to recruit for cooperation, we ended up going right to the top to the chief judge of the traffic court, a man by the name of Carson Schaefer. And we approached him at his home one evening. We didn't want to heat the traffic court up. So we approached him at his home. And he agreed to work with us. He was reluctant at first, and we threw out the name Ken London. And he was very good friends with Ken London. But he understood what we were saying. And he had seen some evidence that maybe London was fixing some cases in his court. And he was very loyal to the traffic court. It was kind of his life. He's like an agent working for the Bureau as our lives. The court was the same for him. So he decided to jump on the team with us. And personally, I had a great working relationship with the judge and a great friendship until he passed away a few years ago. But we had lunch regularly and enjoyed each other's company. And he turned out to be the right, the right man. And I have some more evidence of that coming up. So with Judge Schaefer's help, we figured out that there was a vulnerability in the court system for prosecuting DUIs due to a lack of checks and balances. Remember, this is 1992. Governments didn't really, weren't highly computerized at the time. The Atlanta Traffic Court probably had the smallest budget of a lot of offices in the city of Atlanta. And so they didn't have all the computers they needed, and therefore they weren't doing the checks and balances they should have been doing. Joe, do you remember how many, you know, how large the traffic court was, how many prosecutors they had, how many cases they worked? I don't remember exactly, but it was high volume of cases. It was, of course, they handled DUIs, but they handled all kind of traffic tickets. And there's, there's a lot of hearings for things other than DUIs there. So it was high volume. There weren't that many prosecutors. London touched a lot of what was going on in the traffic court. I, don't, I can't give you a number, but it was a small number of prosecutors. And, and the court was pretty intimate. So working down in the court, because it was kind of small, and they maybe had eight full-time judges and maybe twice that many part-time judges that they could bring in when a full-time judge wanted to go on vacation or something. And that's an important part of my story. The court was a fairly intimate setup. If you walked in the court and you didn't belong there, people were going to notice that. So I was going to have to go, I was going to have to walk into court at some time and because there was valuable evidence there that I was going to have to collect. And part of that was this. At the traffic court, a hard copy file was created for each DUI citation that was submitted to the court by the police for prosecution. That file contained the white copy of the ticket written by the arresting officer it contained the 
defendant's driver's license and, and some other legal documents. If that hard copy file, and this is the vulnerability I was talking about, if that hard copy file was stolen from the court before the case got on the court docket, then the case would never make it to court. The case would just disappear. And that's when you're fixing a case and you're the drunk driver involved in having your case fixed. That's what you want to happen. You want it to just disappear. One of the important facts in the case, and, and you wouldn't really understand the whole story if I didn't point this out. One of the important facts in the case that was that when an Atlanta police officer back then pulled over a drunk driver and wrote him a citation or, you know, a ticket, he used a ticket book that contained colored carbons. The white copy of the ticket was the copy that got turned into the court to get the case started for prosecution. Only the court or the prosecutor should have that copy. A yellow copy, or what was also known as the violator's copy, was given to the drunk driver. It had the court date on it. Only the drunk driver or his lawyer should have the yellow copy. And then there was a pink copy. It was the police officer's copy for his information. So after enlisting the help of Judge Schaefer, the investigation really went slow. It was slow out of the gate, and I wasn't making much progress. So I increased the amount of time that I was lurking around the traffic court working with Judge Schaefer. And we were trying to develop leads on suspicious DUI cases. I knew that would probably heat the courthouse up and that people would wonder why I was there and what I was doing. But it, it was a chance that I would have to take. And like I said before, because of the intimate setup, London certainly knew that I was down there working. And when I go into the courthouse, I recall, I had to walk through metal detectors. And so I'd have to show my badge at the court. And I think the first time I walked in the door and showed my badge, the police officer who let me through the metal detector probably told everybody who would listen to him in the court. And I kind of know that's true from my investigation. So you had to badge your way through because you were armed. Right, exactly. So in the midst of my not making much progress. You were basically looking for something that was not there because the white copies for the tickets that he fixed would not be there anymore. So, I mean, how, how do you look for something that's not there? <laughs> right. You, you hit the nail on the, on the head, right. Jerry. That's exactly right. First, we had to learn the turf, the territory, and then we had to figure out how we were going to adjust our investigation to make some progress. So I was in that adjustment phase when Ken London stopped showing up at work, and he went missing for a couple of weeks. Then I was driving into work after he was missing for a couple of weeks one morning, and I was listening to the radio news back when you only had about three channels on the radio. And the news was reporting that Ken London's dead body was found off a trail in a ravine in the North Georgia mountains about an hour or so north of Atlanta. It was determined that he had overdosed on cocaine and whiskey, and he technically died of exposure. A suicide note was found. The newspapers reported that the suicide note said, it's better this way. I never saw the note. Jennifer recalls that the note said something like, I'm more value to everyone this way. Is that right. what you remember, but Jennifer? Was, I do remember it read like that. I'm of more value to everyone this way. And he left his wedding ring at home on the dresser and he disappeared. And, and there was no real other explanation in the note for the suicide, what appeared to be a suicide. So I got to work after hearing the news and I said to myself, I guess I'm going to need to start closing this case. My, my only subject is dead. Then I got to thinking about it. You know, did London really kill himself because of my investigation or was it something else? I mean, I, I knew he was fixing a few DUIs here and there by that point, but that wouldn't have got him significant jail time and if I had even made the case, and I wasn't close to making a case. So did he kill himself because of my investigation, or was it something else? So it might have been 
I don't remember the exact time frame, but it, it might have been a day or two later. What I do remember when I came to work a day or two later is a really nice day outside. I, I remember this. The sun was out. It looked like a nice day for a drive up to the North Georgia mountains. So before I closed the case, I thought I would go look at the crime scene evidence from London suicide. So I drove up to the White County Sheriff's Office in Cleveland, Georgia, which is a beautiful territory. The Sheriff's Office is who had the, the evidence. I looked through the evidence and I found, among other things, a few yellow copies of DUI tickets that had been found in the trunk of London's car. His car had been found near the scene of his death. So London, as a prosecutor, should have had white copies of tickets, not yellow copies. He must have gotten the yellow copies directly from drunk drivers or their lawyers, and it likely would have been outside the court system. But still, again, London's dead, and I wasn't going to continue to try to make a case on him. And then something happened that turned the case around and brought me to Jennifer. I was thanking the, the very nice female deputy that was helping me look at the evidence. And I was walking out the front door of the sheriff's department. And as I'm crossing the threshold, I'm going to be out the door in about a second. She said, it's really funny that you're the second person that has come here from Atlanta to review the crime scene evidence. And I remember saying to her, oh, yeah, I mean, who was the first? She said, well, the first was Ken London's daughter. I said, what's her name? She said, Jennifer Wallace. I said, do you have any contact information for her? She, she said, uh, how about a driver's license? I got a copy of a driver's license. I said, that'll work. So I got back to the office and I did a little bit of background investigation on Jennifer because again, she's the daughter of my, my subject and I really didn't know where her loyalties lied. As it turned out, she was married and still is married to a very well-respected police officer by the name of Charles Wallace. Never in my career, if I was going to talk to somebody like the wife of a police officer, would I have called that wife without calling the police officer first? You can call it law enforcement courtesy. You can call it just the way things ought to be done. But I, I just wouldn't work that way. I called Charles up and asked if there's any way that I can meet Jennifer and Charles at their at their home, at their convenience. And uh, Charles agreed. We had the meeting and I remember being there for a little while and we were getting comfortable with each other. So Joe, when you went to meet with Jennifer and her husband, what was your purpose? I wasn't making progress in the case. And once I found out that Jennifer was married to a, a solid police officer, I thought there was not a lot of risk. I thought that it was important to get the case on track. I, I knew that Ken London had killed himself for some reason, and maybe he knew a lot more than I knew about his ticket fixing business at that point. And, and I wasn't willing to give up on the case. And this was my best lead to see what Jennifer would know about the case. I did ask the deputy maybe another question or two after she identified Jennifer to me. That was, well, what was she like? The deputy said, you know, I'm kind of profiling my, my next possible witness. I said, what was she like? And she said she was very concerned. She was doing things that a loyal daughter would, would do. She, was, she wanted to get some answers and she seemed like she was doing what good people would do. Yeah. And, and Jennifer, for you, when you find out that he wants to talk to you, why were you willing to talk? I was willing to talk, Jerry, because I wanted to find answers. I was happy he was coming because maybe together we could figure out what has happened, what is going on. At that point in time, I had no idea that he was fixing tickets. So I was happy to talk to Joe and give him any information that I had that might be helpful to the case. About the time that I was thinking that I should wrap this up and not, they had two small children and I didn't want to keep them too late. I remember it being later in the day in the evening after Charles got off of work. And I thought it was time for me to leave. 
about that point in time, Jennifer said, I think she was getting comfortable with me. She said, I, I've got something to show you. And Jennifer left and came back with a briefcase. And she said, this is my father's briefcase. He left it for me before he went missing. He had put the briefcase behind her refrigerator in her home. And when she came home, the refrigerator was kind of popped out. So it wasn't hard to find the briefcase, but it was kind of an unusual place to leave something like that. And we looked inside the briefcase. She showed me inside the briefcase. And inside the briefcase, there were some yellow copies of tickets. And there was the proverbial smoking gun, which was a little black book. And in that book, there were notations regarding money owed to London by a part-time Atlanta traffic court investigator named Carter Sumlin, and also a lawyer named Eddie Castleberry. And that book later became a key piece of evidence when we prosecuted Castleberry and Summerlin. Now, Jennifer, when you handed over that briefcase, did you know what you were handing over? Well, first of all, I I did take one thing out of the briefcase, and that was something that was very special that I had made from my dad in sixth grade, and it was a stained glass piece of art. I removed that, and I knew right then that he was gone. He had to have been gone because this was special to him that I had made, and it hung in every office, every law office that he ever had in the past, and it hung in his office at the traffic court in Atlanta. I did not know what all of that was. I didn't open the book. I guess I focused on that piece of art. I just knew at that moment that my dad was not coming back. There was no way he was coming back if he left that for me. It was my husband that said to me, why are there yellow copies of tickets? And I said, well, he was a solicitor, Charles. He was prosecuting DUIs and vehicular homicides and whatnot. And he said, Jennifer, those yellow copies are given to the people that are charged. Those shouldn't be in here. So I think that that threw up a red flag right there. What are these doing in here? Why are these here? And why has he left this briefcase here? Sounds like Charles knew what the tickets meant. So she showed me the briefcase. Well, from my standpoint, what was really significant was the proverbial little black book, which is probably the smoking gun in the case when you get right down to it. The, the book contained no, notations regarding money owed to London by a part-time Atlanta traffic court investigator named Carter Summerlin, and also money owed to London by a lawyer named Eddie Castleberry. That book became an absolute key piece of evidence when we later prosecuted Castleberry and Summerlin. Once I saw that, I had some further conversation with Jennifer about what she observed about her father around the house. And she said that one thing she said was that she saw her father burn in traffic tickets in the backyard family grill, tickets that he had apparently fixed. Do you remember this, Jennifer? I the, do. I said it was snowing yellow. There was clouds of yellow smoke. He had a barrel grill in the back. And I kept thinking, what is he doing? And I just, I, I guess I, you know, I'm a realist, so I'm not one to live in denial, but I don't know why I didn't go over there and say, what are, why are you burning? What are you doing? <laughs> I didn't. thought he was just but burning trash. But you were trash. young at the time. I was. You were young at the time. I was. Well, in, in addition to the yellow snow in the backyard, so to speak, Jennifer told me that her father regularly met a part-time Atlanta traffic court investigator named Carter Summerlin at a sports bar in Atlanta named Stooges, like the Three Stooges. And she said, she told me, that her father also did a lot of business with a lawyer by the name of Eddie Castleberry, as well as with another young female lawyer named Lisa. And I'm not going to use Lisa's last name today. So I got great evidence out of that meeting at Jennifer and Charles's house. Meanwhile, back at the Atlanta traffic court, Judge Schaefer had purchased some computer software that was able to track DUI citations that had come into the court over the past 10 to 15 years, like they should have been tracked all along. And one day he called me at my office and he asked me to come to the court. And I said, Judge, uh, I'm really busy at the moment. Can I come later? And he said, no, I, I really need you to come down right now. And I remember arguing with him just a little bit. I, you know, he was the judge. 
and I had tremendous respect for him. So I wasn't really going to argue too hard, but he convinced me that I needed to go to his office. So I drove downtown, FBI offices, a little north of the city. I drove into the center of the city where the courthouse was, the Atlanta traffic court, and I walked into the judge's office. And when I walked in, I remember he bent down, opened the drawer of his desk, pulled out a thick computer printout the size of the Atlanta phone book thick, and he threw it on his desk and he said, guess what this is? And I said, I don't know. I have no idea. What is it? He said, I found there are more than 6,000 DUIs over the last decade or so that have disappeared from this court that were never prosecuted. After the shock of that wore off a little bit, we did the math, and that's like one to two drunk drivers per day who didn't have to face the consequences of their actions, likely back on the roads of Atlanta drinking and driving. Wow. But the question was, you know, were all those cases fixed or was the court just dysfunctional somehow? Plus, did London fix all those cases, maybe in a conspiracy with the investigator Summerlin and the lawyer Castleberry, or, or was something else going on? So another question that came up at that point was, how is London connecting with all these drunk drivers? And so our investigation, just to shortcut this a little bit, our investigation revealed that Castleberry and Summerlin were bringing him cases. But London had established another very unique and efficient system for connecting with drunk drivers who wanted to pay their way out of DUIs. Now, it's important to know that Stooges was in a bit of a bar district off of Howe Mill Road in Atlanta, just north of the city on I-75. And there was a pretty sizable number of day drinkers patronizing those bars. I tracked down an Atlanta police officer working the beat that included Stooges. His name was Mike McCain, and I'm friends with him to this day. He calls me his little brother. Mike is a, a big old Irish cop, and he's classic. He worked his beat like it should be worked. And just as an aside, Mike's pretty much an American hero. He, he was in a shootout in Atlanta and dragged one of his fellow officers to safety in that shootout. And he's pretty well known for that. It was fortuitous that I ran into Mike because Mike worked his beat the way it should be. And he knew everybody everywhere on his beat. He introduced me to a bartender at Stooges. And that bartender is who revealed London's system to me. So here it is. The word was out on Howe Mill Road that you didn't have to worry about getting a DUI because there was someone at Stooges who could make them go away. When you walked into Stooges, Stooges is a bar that had a lot of wood paneling and it had a huge wooden, light-colored wooden bar kind of right in the center. No matter how early in the day you walked in there, there was always people sitting at that bar. And on the corner of that bar was an oversized brandy snifter. And it was kind of like a big fishbowl that always sat there. And people would regularly come into Stooges and drop yellow copies of traffic citations, including DUIs, with their phone numbers written on them into that brandy snifter. And that was London's inbox. Wow. That was his inbox for his ticket fixing operation. Wow. And London would come in almost every day and pick the tickets up. He would sit in the same booth. That was his office. There was a traffic sign over his booth that said something like, Jennifer, do you remember, did it say London Street that was no. nailed to the wall? No, let me tell you where that came from. I took that. Before I knew all of this, I went to his office and cleaned it out. I, I don't know why no one else did that, but I took it upon myself to go to his office and there was a new solicitor in his place who was extremely nice. And I went through his things and there was a plaque there with his name. And I took that to Stooges and had them place that there. Oh, okay. I didn't know that because I had That's been where in that Stooges came from. Until after he <laughs> I didn't know that that's away. where his office was until today, but there you go. Yep, that was his ticket fixing, his unofficial office. All right, well, that makes me feel a little better that that sign wasn't there when he was actually fixing tickets. That was something no. that happened afterwards. That, I took uh, that there. Did yes, you know I about the, the giant brandy sniffer? No, and I, I can't even recall seeing it. You might not take note unless you 
had been told what the purpose was. No, but, but I would have turned him there. in and done the right thing. I would have turned him in. Ooh. So you didn't so, know, Jennifer, that it was so blatant? No, wow. no. I have chills while Joe is talking. And I understand that that was one of the reasons that you wanted to participate is that you wanted to hear some of the full details that you didn't know. Yes, that's correct. So many years later. I'm in a good place, though, to hear them. So the other fact about that was Carter Summerlin would regularly join London at Stooges. And the system was set up, in my opinion, based on everything I know in our investigation. The system was set up so that London never had to deal directly with any drunk drivers who might possibly be wearing a wire or might be able to testify against him later. You know, it was one layer of insulation between him and the drunk drivers. Another thing that we learned was that the cost of getting a DUI fixed by London was between $1,500 and $6,500. And that was somehow based or somewhat based upon how many DUIs a person would have had. And the more DUIs that a drunk driver had, hypothetically, the more dangerous it is for London and his crew to fix the tickets because there might be more people looking at these habitual violators. So he charged more if you had numerous DUIs. And again, keep in mind, so $1,500 to $6,500 was the range that we found. And if you do the math and you just use the minimum ticket fixing fee, and you multiply it times 6,000 DUIs that disappeared from the Atlanta traffic court, the minimum potential dirty money pool is $9 million. Wow. I had to ask Jennifer, you know, you didn't know anything about the ticket fixing scheme, but since it generated so much cash, did you notice that your father seemed to be living above his means? Yes, I did. There were there was always a lot of cash around our house when I was growing up. He would give my mom $100 in cash every day. He would place it up on top of the dresser where he kept his gun always. And one time, he and my mom drove to Alabama and paid cash for Mercedes, which they both drove Mercedes. We had a full-time mate whom I loved dearly. We had a beautiful home in Atlanta. We had a really nice cabin up at Lake Burton in the North Georgia mountains, along with a sailboat and an inboard outboard boat. There were trips to Europe. So yes, I saw that he was living above his means. Well, you know, at the end, you know, when he commits suicide, and and I haven't said, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. I truly am. I don't want to be callous and and just talking about the the death of your father without acknowledging that. Thank Um, you. But there was the use of cocaine and, of course, having money, especially in in that time period in the 90s, wild parties and spending big money. And did you notice that he was using cocaine? I never saw my dad use cocaine, but there was a lot of evidence that he did. For example, when he walked me down the aisle on my wedding day, I noticed that there was white powder on his nose and he always had sinus problems. And another thing that I remember is there was a sting set up in Buckhead at Anthony's, a very nice restaurant. I've never been there, never had gone there, but I believe it was an FBI sting, right, Joe? And my dad was on the invitation list. And I thought about this yesterday. He was invited and the FBI came in and everyone, he described having to get on the ground and He didn't understand why he was invited to something like this. And there were so many people arrested. There were a lot of lucrative people there. There were a lot of well-known attorneys that were there. And some of those were arrested. But that put thought into my head. Why would my father be invited to something that shows up in the paper the next day that it was a huge FBI staying arrayed and he was there? So I thought, you know, Birds of a feather flock together. So that was, that was of interest to me. That put some thought into my head. Was he actually using drugs? And remember, Jerry, at the beginning of this, 
I said that we had some historical information on London and that he had met with an undercover agent posing as a criminal. Right. Well, that was a famous case in Atlanta called Nickel Ride, a famous undercover operation. There were a lot of people convicted in that case. And he was just so far down the ladder as far as his being a defendant in the case that he, he never got prosecuted. But that's, that was the culmination of that case that night that Jennifer just described. Mm. So it's funny that Jennifer would know that side of it and I would know the other side of it. That's uh, very interesting. We've never compared these kind of notes. No, we haven't. <laughs> so this is the first time I'm hearing that. I remember him describing that to me and how scary it was. And that he, he said, they, here they came. Doors were busted wide open. And everyone was under, you know, put your hands up. How scary. Right. Yep. Especially when you think you're going to get prosecuted for it. Absolutely. That would have been enough right there and then for him to have had enough of whatever he was doing. It was a warning. So, so Joe, why don't we go back to your little black book? Now, even though London is, you know, dead, you know, now you can re resurrect your case because you have other defendants. Yeah, that, that's correct. One of the things we had to determine was how do we know that Summerlin and Castleberry had a big part in those 6,000 missing DUIs, fixing them through London? How do we know those 6,000 cases are on them, that they did that kind of volume. So we had to come up with, you know, we knew they were fixing cases, but we wanted to solve the entire problem. If they were just fixing a portion of those 6,000, then we had more people to find. So what we decided to do was we took the judge's computer printout, and that printout identified in those 6,000 missing cases, it identified the defendants. It had the defendant's name off the ticket that had originally come into the courthouse, but had gone missing. So we selected 200 of those defendants. And with some help from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, our buddies over there, we put together a team and we really quickly flipped about 50 of those defendants for their cooperation. We gave them immunity through the U.S. Attorney's Office. We gave them immunity for federal charges. And we told them, you won't have to go to court federally, but you're going to have to face some music on your DUIs. So about 50 of the people that we tracked down off of that list of 6,000, or our list of 200, took that deal. And out of those 50, just about all 50 had either dealt with London, Summerlin, or Castleberry directly, or they dropped the yellow copy of their DUI tickets in the brandy snifter at Stooges. So there was one or two other names of crooked lawyers in Atlanta that surfaced out of that investigation of those 200 cases. But clearly, the bulk of the fixing was being done by Lon London, Summerlin, and Castleberry. There was other evidence that they were doing a really high volume of business. For example, one of our drunk driver witnesses testified for the government that he went to Castleberry's home to pay him and get his driver's license back. And on that occasion, Castleberry pulled out a large stack of white copies of citations with driver's licenses stapled to them. Now, this is just a snapshot in time. This is just one day in this decade of ticket fixing, and Castleberry's got a stack of white citations with driver's licenses stapled to them. And so when our witness was at his house, Castleberry had to sift through a whole lot of tickets to find the witness's driver's license. That's a pretty good indication that there was big volume being done by Castleberry. And again, Castleberry shouldn't have the white copy because that's the court copy, right? That's exactly right. Those white copies had to have been stolen from the court. Ultimately, the hardest part of the cases against Castleberry and Summerlin who were tried in two separate trials, was to prove that they had paid a public official, being London, to use his official position as a traffic court prosecutor to make the DUIs go away. What I'm talking about now is we had to prove, actually prove payments went 
from Summerlin to London and payments went from Castleberry to London. And as Castleberry pointed out to one of our informants during the investigation at one point, well, they can't prove that because London's dead. And we, I never paid him with anybody else in the room. So guess what? We, we can do it. And the way we're going to do it is through circumstantial evidence. The little black book from London's briefcase noting money owed from Castleberry to London and money owed from Summerlin to London, that was, like I said, the smoking gun. That's the primary circumstantial evidence in the case. But also, Castleberry was a little bit loose-lipped when he did his business. And what he would do is to justify the amount of his fees to fix DUIs when drunk drivers would say, hey, you know, that's a lot of money to fix a case. Castleberry would say, well, I got to pay somebody in the solicitor's office to make the case go away. So, hey, give me a break. I got to make money. He's got to make money. And he would justify his fees that way. And so we had witnesses who would testify that Castleberry told him that, that he had to pay someone in the solicitor's office. When Ken London died, Castleberry was in the middle of fixing a DUI for somebody, for one of our ultimate witnesses. And he told that drunk driver after London died that I can't fix your case because London is dead. And before London had committed suicide, Castleberry was all about fixing the case. After London committed suicide, Castleberry said, I cannot fix your case because Ken London is dead. So that's some more evidence that combined with the payments noted in the book and the other statements that Castleberry made that Castleberry was paying London. In addition to that, we obtained the cooperation of Lisa, the other lawyer who worked with London. And that's a pretty long story how that happened. But we approached through Mike McCain, the beat cop, We identified a drunk driver who Mike saw was driving when he shouldn't have been driving because he had just written him a a DUI. So we found that gentleman, found out that his lawyer was Lisa, and I called Lisa and set up a meeting. Now, Lisa, she was the top of her class in law school. She looked like a movie star. She, She practiced law in the mornings and was a bodybuilder in the afternoon. And she drove a, a new red Dodge Viper sports car with a, I remember had a hardwired cell phone in it, you know, when nobody had that in their cars back then. I'm sure her looks opened a lot of doors into the conspiracy here. Although she worked with and was friends with London before London died, she had never met Castleberry. They were, for some reason, compartmentalized from each other. But she didn't meet Castleberry until London's wake. Uh, the wake was at Stooges, wasn't it, Jennifer? Yes. There were close to 2,000 people at my dad's funeral. So the wake was then afterwards at Stooges. A, a, fitting, a fitting place for it. Uh, exactly. So Lisa met Castleberry at the wake, and they, they ultimately ended up starting to date. Lisa was a witness for us. And she testified that on one weekend after London's death, she went to Castleberry's very beautiful lake home in the North Georgia mountains. And he confided in her at the time that he paid for his lake home by getting DUIs fixed, that he had paid London thousands of dollars to make DUIs disappear from the court. He said the problem now is that London had stolen the case files, but had not erased the DUIs from the court's computer system. And Judge Schaefer had found the cases. What made me laugh was that Ken London wasn't going to be your most computer literate guy. We were investigating old school and he was fixing the tickets old school. And then Ju- Judge Schaefer bought the software and we came into the, you know, the 20th century at that point with the technology. It was a big part of making the case. I would assume that as a police officer who, and you brought this up in the one instance, but as a police officer who's written 
you know, a ticket for a drunk driving, you know, after 6,000 of your people that you've written tickets for never make it to court, you've never, you're never asked to go to court and testify against these drunk driving cases that you start to wonder, they couldn't have all just automatically pled guilty. I mean, what's going on? How come I never go to court on any of these drunk driving violations? Well, one thing I didn't say initially was the word was out on the street that you could fix a DUI. Very astute observation, Jerry. Because of that point, the police officers were wondering, but not all all that many police officers, because a lot of police officers who have a lot of different kind of things to do in their day, and they don't really have court appearances very efficiently worked into police officer schedules in Atlanta, at least at that time. So they would end up spending extra time, have to go to court. A lot of the police officers weren't complaining about not going to court. They kind of appreciated that. When they would check on a case every once in a while, somebody would tell them, oh, the case was probably settled. So no, no court appearance required. But it wasn't until Atlanta Because of things like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, MAD, that organization, they started raising the profile, the awareness of drunk driving and the damage done by it. Atlanta, and that was in the mid-80s before I started my case. Well, Atlanta, somewhere around the end of the 80s, they started up a DUI task force. Now, those officers started really making that observation that, hey, there's something not right here. I'm not going to court enough. Not that I, you know, want to go to court more, but I'm putting my heart and soul on this DUI business and solving the problem. You know, I want to see it through. So, right. There was a word on the street that cases could be fixed. It kind of bubbled up to the surface with that wiretap. Now, Lisa went to work for us and was a tremendous witness for us. She also told us that When she was at Castleberry's cabin on the lake up in the North Georgia mountains, that Castleberry threatened to kill Judge Schaefer and another judge. Now, that evidence, although it was talked about in open court, the jury was asked to leave. And I don't recall exactly why the judge made the decision not to allow it, but it was kind of a he said, she said, probative value versus prejudice kind of analysis, I assume, the judge was making. And he just decided he didn't want the case overturned, I think, putting thoughts in in his mind at this point. But I assume he didn't want the case overturned on a shaky decision. So he decided not to let that he said, she said kind of information into the trial. So that the fact Although it was talked about in open court without the jury there. And it got in the newspaper that Castleberry had threatened to kill Judge Schaefer, among, among others. But what Lisa did testify to was that Castleberry, you know, he had heard about these computer viruses. And Castleberry asked her if she knew anyone who could introduce a, a computer virus into the traffic court's computer system. He's desperate. And he's telling her, hey, I am afraid of this FBI investigation. And I don't want my son to ever see me go to jail. So Lisa's telling us all this. He's just grasping at straws. Castleberry's trial was was really pretty high profile in Atlanta, as was Lisa's testimony against him. Lisa later told me that she she felt blackballed in the Atlanta legal community because she testified against another lawyer. She ended up having to move out of Georgia to resume her legal practice elsewhere, which I hate that part, that that outcome, but she did the right thing, in my opinion, and and was punished for it. There are a couple other things, if we have time, a couple other interesting things that occurred at the trials of Castleberry and Summerlin. One of the things revolves around a particular old saying in criminal trials. You've heard this, Jerry. If the defense can't win on the facts and they can't win on the law, what do they try to do? They attack attack the government. That's correct. So at the Summerlin's trial, his defense attorney tried to attack me. I was thinking about this part of my presentation when you said about how things affect the witnesses' families and the agents' families. So here's a way this affected my family. Castleberry fixed DUIs for a number of strippers at the higher-end strip clubs in Atlanta. 
kind of like the Gold Club, which the FBI later shut down. So we ended up having to call a couple of those strippers as witnesses. And they were, they were colorful people. It's like having tigers by the tail a little bit when you're trying to get them to cooperate. So Castleberry's lawyer, through his cross-examination of one of those strippers, tried to establish that I was having an affair with her. And that was completely false. And there was absolutely no basis for it other than the facts that the stripper referred to me from the witness stand by my first name instead of saying something like Agent Roebuck. So the lawyer just tried to make something out of that. Oh, I'm too familiar. We're too familiar. When are you interviewing her? Oh, lunchtime. Oh, noon. And was there ever anybody there? And, and the stripper would say, well, no, there wasn't. And she later corrected her testimony that, oh, yeah, there was always somebody else there. But he was leading her down a path like defense attorneys normally do. He ended up asking a few too many questions. And he butchered the cross and the jury saw right through it. Now, for younger agents, if you don't interview jurors after your trials, you're missing a boat because those are your ultimate consumers. That's your audience. I always, when I could, when I was given permission to do it by the judge, I would interview jurors after my trials. And when I went to the jurors, they commonly are happy to speak to the agents. And they said that they were a little bit on the fence because of the circumstantial nature of our case about convicting Castleberry until that lawyer attacked me. And they said, once he attacked you, it was so sleazy that we we were all for conviction at that point. So, So it blew up in his face. It blew up in his face. The part about how it affected my family a little bit was that ironically, I had invited my wife to the courtroom that day. Oh. because I told her we we're going to have some colorful witnesses on the schedule. I always tried to include my family in my work, which was rare when I could do it, but I, I would have my kids see my trials when I testified and things so they'd get a little bit of a civics lesson. And I tried to get my wife out of the house, and I invited her in for lunch that day, like, like we'll have lunch, come early, and see these colorful witnesses. But I just didn't know quite how colorful it was going to be for me that day. (laughs) It was colorful. Wow. But my my wife, she had been a paralegal. She had been through court. She understood that I might be attacked. You know, at times we talked about things like that. So she completely got it. And actually it helped the case. So it helped push push the jury towards conviction. And I want to point out, and I, and I do want Jennifer to, I want to give Jennifer a chance to speak. But I think one thing that's important about these trials that each trial we had, both, of, both trials, had several drunk drivers who testified. And I was thinking before I was coming on today about some of the, those drunk drivers being witnesses. And I remember one of them who testified had 12 DUIs. He had 10 in Atlanta all of those were fixed. And he had two outside of Atlanta that weren't fixed. And then we had another drunk driver who took the witness stand and testified. He said, I drink every day and I drive drunk every day. And, and, and that was his testimony. And, and he used London's operation to never have to worry about getting a DUI. So clearly the streets of Atlanta were significantly more dangerous because of London's ticket fixing operation. In the end, Summerlin and Castleberry were were convicted for things like conspiracy to violate the Hobbs Act, and they both ended up in prison. Typical corruption case sentences, Castleberry got three and a half years, Summerlin got two and a half. My recollection is Castleberry got the extra year because he was a lawyer doing this, violating his ethical oaths. And, And then Judge Schaefer, and the traffic court started issuing bench warrants for these 6,000 drunk drivers who never had to face the consequences. And he was trying to recover the millions of dollars in fines that the court didn't get to pay for its operations because all those cases disappeared. So I just want to throw those last couple of things in. Jennifer was instrumental, not only in our investigation, but in our prosecution and our trial presentation. And, you know, we couldn't have done it without her. Absolutely. 
And, and we couldn't have done it without the others. But Jennifer was, you know, the tip of our sphere in a, in a number of different ways. Well, Jennifer, before I ask you about testifying in court, I take it that this is the first time that you've heard about the impact of your father's corruption. I'd like to give you the opportunity to share with us how that's sitting with you and the kind of relationship that you had with your dad. I mean, this has got to be... It's, it's profound. I have said in the past, I had a excellent, just an excellent relationship with my father growing up. And I'd like to say that I was adopted and he chose me and I knew he loved me and I loved him and I respected him. My relationship with him was extremely close. And his death, Jerry was tragic. It was probably the most tragic thing I've ever been through in my life. And I had to seek counseling, some deep counseling to learn how to process all of this, not only his death, but all that was going on that surrounded the circumstances of this case. Hearing Joe give an account of this case today, yes, it's the first time I've heard a lot of this, and it touches on so many things. A lot of it, you know, I've, I could mention the word betrayal and allowing habitual violators out on our streets, loose to drive, putting innocent drivers in harm's way is, is just, I can't imagine. And also, I can't imagine it because he instilled in me uh, never to drink and drive, nor have I ever done that. I've never had a DUI. I don't drink. If I go on vacation, I might share a sip or two with my husband on the beach. And that's, that's as far as that goes. I kind of have developed a, a bad taste for alcohol in my head just because of, of, of what I know. I didn't know how deep all of this went, Joe. I do believe that my dad should have suffered consequences as well. As much as I loved him, he should have had consequences. So I just, I hope no one was killed on the streets due to the fact that he fixed these tickets and allowed them back onto the streets to drive. How dangerous and how demoralizing it is to police officers to work the shifts that they work the time spent away from their families and holidays and whatnot and all of their work for what? Just to be erased. Very demoralizing. It makes me angry to know that he allowed this, that he thought this was okay. Even though you didn't know how deep this went, when you were asked to testify, you knew enough that you said yes. Absolutely. And, and, why, and, and, and could you tell us why you wanted to testify, you needed to testify because you had to authenticate the briefcase and what was in the briefcase, but you could have said no. Well, I'm going to say this. There was a reason why he left that briefcase at my home that day, and I do believe in my heart that he knew that I was honest and that I would do the right thing. I do. And that I would advocate and do the right thing on his behalf. And I think that he left it there because he knew that I would tell. So I'm glad Joe found me. Very glad. In fact, if he had not found me, I would have sought out the FBI myself. I knew I had to testify. One of the reasons is that I'm married to a police officer and he has taken the oath. Even though I'm his wife, he's honest and he's going to tell. He's, he's, he has to tell. He has taken the oath to, to talk about and to report anything that is, is wrong. I knew I had to do it because I'm married to him. We, we always do the right thing. And I wanted the truth to come to light. I felt that the people that were involved with my dad I needed to have consequences. And in part, because their actions led to my dad's death. And like I said before, my dad did wrong. He made poor choices, definitely. Some illegal, dishonest, corrupt decisions, consciously. He, he made these decisions. He made this choice to do this. But the other people that were involved in this as well needed to, to have consequences. So that's well, why I testified. Well, what stands out about when you testified? You know, what, do you, I was, what do you remember? 
I was scared. I was scared of the federal prosecutor. He had a very stern demeanor, and he made me feel as though I had done something wrong, when in fact I had not. I was, I was, I was afraid. Also, I was very worried about someone hurting or killing me after I testified. I was afraid that there were some really bad people involved in all of this. And it seemed like organized crime to me. But with my husband being a police officer and I had Joe's telephone number, I felt like between the two of them, I was counting on them to keep me safe if someone tried to come after me. What did you testify about? I testified about, first of all, knowing these two individuals, Carter Summerlin and Eddie Castleberry. They were always a part of my dad's life. Occasionally, I did go to Stooges with my dad, but it was lunch. And I think I was the only one that did not drink alcohol there at lunchtime. They were able to drink and go back to work. And how, I don't know. I also testified about a fur coat. Joe, can you help me with that? Because I'm not sure I I testified, but I don't remember how that came about. The long, full-length mink fur coat that uh yeah i i do i do eddie castleberry had told lisa that among the things that your dad was able to do because of the ticket fixing money that eddie was paying him was buy his wife a fur coat so our prosecutors wanted to link that up during our trial presentation so they ask you hey is that true did your did Ken's wife and it it was his second wife by then. Right. Correct. Correct. Did did Ken's wife get a fur coat? Yes, she did. I was over there when she was boasting about it and I had seen mink stoles and wraps and whatnot, but this was probably the most gorgeous coat I've ever seen. And of course, when they're always sat and lined and normally they have a monogram and her monogram was there on the left-hand side inside the coat and it was gorgeous. And I said, oh, could I just try it on? I, I would just like to try that on just once and see what that feels like. So I did. And I took it off and handed it back to her, but that was a lavish gift that he had purchased for her. A lavish gift that a a solicitor at a traffic court probably would not normally be able to pay for out of his salary. Eddie Castleberry directly linked it to payments from Eddie Castleberry to Ken London. I I knew for certain they would come after me after all that. I was worried. But at at the end, I I take it that your, your testimony was accepted and there were no threats to you? No, no, there were no threats. I have run into several of those people and judges since then. In fact, I attended a funeral a couple of weeks ago with someone who was actually, my father worked for the city of Atlanta Police Department at one time, and he was a police officer with my dad so long ago. So, and judges, I've occasionally run into some judges who have recognized me and asked how I'm doing. It's a weird feeling to see people that were intertwined with all of this, that knew him. Of course, the word you always hear is closure. Has participating in this interview, do you think it's brought you closure? Or are you, are you in a place that, that you're able to, to listen to this and, and come away feeling enlightened? I'm thankful for today that you've allowed me to share. And you're welcome. So yes, so yes, it has brought closure. I wish that my dad could have said no, and this would have never happened. I've learned a lot today, and you both have helped me understand. Joe, you've helped me understand more than I thought I knew. So I'm thankful for today. And yes, I think it brings a lot of closure. Oh, that makes me feel very happy. It makes me feel good, too. I'm not sad. I feel relieved, actually. I know firsthand how emotional this whole thing was for Jennifer from the first time we met, I mean, before the first time we met, when she was out for two weeks searching for her missing father and then getting the news that his body was found and and then getting caught up in our investigation. Her interest in what we were doing 
in a way was gone in a, in a sense because her father was gone. But right. then we come in and say, no, we need you. And it took a lot of courage. And I, I don't use that word lightly here. It took a lot of courage for her to get on the witness stand. And I didn't know I if know. I was going to come out of the ladies' room in the federal building. I was like, if I just stay in here, certainly no one's going to come in here and get me. I'm just going to stay here. I wouldn't have no, come into the ladies' room I, to get you. I know you wouldn't <laughs> have, but I'm just saying. I was like, do I go out there? I was very nervous. But I'm so thankful that I did it because it was the right thing to do. She was a terrific witness. We wouldn't have had the results that we had. People wouldn't have been held accountable. The, the ticket fixing business in Atlanta wouldn't have taken a big hit without Jennifer's testimony. When people make the wrong choices and they're caught up in criminal activity, it will come to light sometime, maybe not when you want it to, but it will eventually catch up. And the guilt, you know, the guilt that he must have been feeling, I would hope that the guilt is what led him in taking his life. I would hope that the guilt just was eating him up alive, knowing how wrong he was doing, because it was wrong. I searched for two weeks. I left my small children with my mother my dad's first wife, and I searched. I went to the Georgia State Patrol. I posted flyers. I, I spent the night up at the lake house by myself. I went on a search. I was probably five miles from his body. I didn't know he was right off of the Richard B. Russell Scenic Highway in White County, but I was close. My mission there was to try to maybe save him, find out why, come back. You know, what what are you doing? Why have you disappeared? I wanted to find him. I, I didn't get to say goodbye. That's hard. So, Jerry, if you're looking for somebody as an example of how what we do at the FBI can affect our witnesses' lives, how, what those witnesses go through, how you need to empathize with those people in order to get the right thing done and bring people to trial. If you're looking for somebody as an example of, of the kind of people that FBI agents run into and develop relationships with to get the right thing done, I mean, I, I can't think of anybody better than Jennifer London Wallace a, as that example. She was under extreme emotional distress and she came through like a champ in the case, despite suffering despite having to seek counseling, you know, all while she's trying to raise a family and be a good wife to a police officer who goes to work every day in a dangerous profession. She had a lot on her plate. I couldn't have done anything without Jennifer and some of the other witnesses in the case. So, well, I want to take a second, Joe, and tell you how much I appreciate you for being so professional and for having so much empathy while I was going through all of that. And Jerry, thank you for your condolences on my dad's death. It was very difficult. It really was. It's not anything for the person who dies. They're gone. But for the people that are left behind and wondering and, and trying to make sense of all of it, being able to share today has definitely helped me so much. So I appreciate that. And I thank you both. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And Joe, I have to say to you, this was a case that you know, it kind of was a throwaway case that was given to a new agent because there wasn't much there. And boy, it became a major case. I've been looking at all the newspaper articles. You know, who knew? Right. Well, I, I, <laughs> who knew, including me? I, I certainly didn't know. I barely knew what I was doing as an agent at the time. Well, let me ask you the, the question that I always ask. When did you join the FBI and, and why did you join the FBI? Why did you want to be a special agent? <laughs> well, I joined the Bureau in 1985. And the reason that I got interested in the Bureau was I had an aunt who was a squad secretary in the Washington field office. And as you know, Jerry, I'm sure, back in the mid 80s, the squad secretaries kind of ran the Bureau. I mean, agents Absolutely. took their marching orders from the secretaries. You didn't get that job unless you were highly experienced and squared away and confident in dealing with strong personalities. 
So that was my aunt. And when I was in middle school, she came to me and said, you know, I think being an FBI agent is a job you might enjoy doing and you might actually be able to do it. And so I kept that in mind. And I remember having a career day at school and I said, I'm going to do a little research on FBI agents. So my interest continued. And then when I was in college, my aunt invited me to FBI headquarters and she set up a little faux interview there. And I had my girlfriend who's now been my wife for 40 years. We were both there. They're giving me the dog and pony show and taking me to the indoor firing range and doing the demonstration. And I was hooked. After college, I, I went to law school. I didn't even know a lawyer. I had no interest in practicing law, but I was pursuing the agent's position. Got out, passed the bar, worked for a judge for a year, and then he allowed me to extend for a year while I was applying to the Bureau, and it got kind of delayed. But I came in through your office, Jerry. I came in through Philadelphia. Yay, Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> So that's how I got that's how I got started. So when did you retire and what are you doing now? I retired in uh, January 2013 and immediately we started a company called Gold Shield 1811 and we do investigations and security consulting and I operate it with my business partner Don Kidd who's also a former FBI agent and both of our wives have a important position in the company with us. So that is terrific that we can make it kind of a family affair. And our company is basically a big labor pool of some of the best former federal agents in the Southeast, mostly from the FBI. But we had partners at the IRS and Homeland Security and Secret Service. We've done over 100 successful projects and cases for large corporations and law firms and high net worth individuals. And uh, I'm having a blast. I will make sure to put a link to your firm's website in the show notes for this episode. Before we go, I'd like to see if, if Jennifer has any last words, and then we'll end with, with you, Joe. Jennifer? Thank you. Jerry, I've enjoyed spending time with you all on your podcast. And Joe, I appreciate you inviting me. My pleasure, Jennifer. Thank you both for your service. I think that your jobs and your, your careers are just uh, so interesting. Joe, I'd like to say to you that you're one of the most professional people that I've ever worked with. And back to the conversation in the court when your wife was there, she doesn't have anything to worry about <laughs> because you're such a professional person and you're just, I don't think you would ever cross the line. I'm just thankful for today. I feel so thankful that you've allowed me to share my story and to listen in on all the details. You've tied all of that up and made me feel at ease. All right, Joe, your last words? Thinking about this case, yeah, I guess one message I might want to send to agents that are, were young like I was when I started this case is you don't always get to use all the whiz-bang gizmos and techniques that the FBI has available. Sometimes you just have to make cases based on relationships. You have to treat people right. You know, that's really what most agents do, especially the more experience they get. They treat people right at every level. And this was a big team effort. I mean, from the courageous witnesses like Jennifer Wallace and Lisa to the bartender at Stooges, who I recently spoke to on the telephone. So I'm still in touch with them. To all that hard work Judge Schaefer did, to make our case happen and to help the traffic court, to help the people of Atlanta. And then all the assistance we got from Atlanta police officers like Mike McCain and our partners at Georgia Bureau of Investigation and all the help I got from my squad mates and the prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office who ultimately did their thing and landed the convictions. It was all about us forming into a big team. And, it, and it's kind of crazy that 30 years later, almost, I, I'm still in touch with a majority of these people. I think we bonded in a way through this case. And I'm sure I didn't adequately explain all the layers in the relationships in the case, but we certainly bonded for a good cause, seeking justice. I've always felt really good about the case for that reason. And that's the end of the interview. 
at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Joe Roebuck and photos of Jennifer Wallace London, Ken London, Eddie Castleberry, and Carter Summerlin, as well as newspaper articles about this case. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. 